This is going to finish up the rest of John chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 6. And we're going to talk about what a true preacher is. And we're going to look at John the Baptist because he is a good example of a true preacher. And in John 1, 6 it says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. So number one, a true preacher is sent from God. God sends out men to do his work and he gives them as gifts to the saints, to the body of Christ. In Ephesians four eleven through 12, it says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So it's okay to learn from other men. God uses men to make known the sense of his words. Notice that his name is John. It isn't Joan or Janus because he is a man sent from God. God sends men. 1 Timothy 2.12 says, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Men aren't better than women, but God chose men to preach and teach. A woman preacher is against scripture. Women preachers like Paula White and Joyce Meyer have very false doctrine and they're led by the devil. And this is evident when you see the rebellion of the word of God and love for money. And this isn't strange that women preachers go against the Bible because being a woman preacher in itself is against the Bible. Not because men are better than women. That's just what God said, so we have to go by what he says in the Bible. But number two, a true preacher points you towards the light. So back to John chapter 1. We just read verse 6 and now verse 7. It says, This same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. Jesus Christ is the light of men. John's purpose was to manifest Jesus Christ to Israel. If you look at John chapter 1 and verse 31, it says, And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. So when a man points towards the true light, then he isn't exalting himself. John wasn't exalting himself. He was exalting Jesus Christ. He didn't come to show himself as a great man. He came to show Israel the Lord Jesus Christ. And when a man doesn't point you to Jesus Christ, he is trying to put himself in the limelight. An example of this is when a man creates a list of standards and rules that you have to live by or a list of works that you have to do to show and prove that you're saved and these are always standards that he lives by easily himself he's not going to create a list of standards that he struggles with when he creates his list of standards and rules and works then he can tell you who is saved and who isn't saved based on those standards and so he plays God a man puts himself in the limelight when he makes a list of standards. A man also puts himself in the light when he corrects the King James Bible. He's not pointing towards Jesus Christ. He's trying to make himself look good. He gives you the impression that you have to come to him to know what God says. He makes himself the final authority and in a way makes himself godlike. And when a man corrects the book, he makes himself his own God. And this is the philosophy of Satanism. A true preacher will point you towards the light. That's the word of God. That's Jesus Christ. Psalms 119.105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When a man corrects the book, he is trying to blow out the light bulb or light source or blow out your candle. He is taking your headlights that you can't see anything without the Bible and without Jesus Christ. Any light you have When it comes to the Bible and Jesus Christ, when he changes the word, that it puts that light out. So a true preacher is a witness 
for the light of men, which is Jesus Christ. And notice how John the Baptist exalts Jesus Christ above himself. If you look at John chapter 1 and verse 15, it says, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. So John did not think he was something special. He knew he wasn't as holy and true as Jesus Christ. He said Jesus Christ was before him, even though Jesus Christ came after him. John was six months older than Jesus Christ, but yet he knew Jesus Christ was God and had been here throughout eternity. And that's why he says, He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. He was born after John in the sense of being a man, but he, had, he was before John in the sense that he's God. Jesus Christ as God has always been here, and he created everything. Jesus Christ said, Before Abraham was, I am. And John said in John one twenty seven, He it is, who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I am not worthy to unloose. And don't get confused just because this is the Gospel of John. It's not John the Baptist writing. It's John the Apostle. And then in John one nineteen through 20, it says, And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Uh, all these big shot priests and Levites came to ask John who he was. He didn't try to impress anybody. He just said, I am not the Christ. He wasn't looking for worship or praise or to exalt his name before the name of Jesus Christ. But some of these cult leaders that you see will never admit that they are wrong on anything. And when you claim to be right on everything, you claim to be God and might as well be saying, I am the Christ. Sure, we continue to believe what we believe because we think it's right. But anyone who reads the Bible knows they don't know everything, and they know they have to be wrong somewhere, even if they don't know where it is that they're wrong. If a person isn't trying to be God, they will point you to the final authority. A true preacher who points you toward the light and exalts the Savior will say, I am not the Christ. I am not the final authority. The Bible is the final authority. The light and the words of God are close connected. It shows and reveals things that are invisible. It shows the dirtiness of the world, kind of like how your room looks clean in the dark. You turn on the light, and you can see all the dust. A true preacher points you toward the light. The light leads you to get cleaned up in your life. John one twenty nine says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John knew the Savior when he saw him. A true preacher recognizes the true light when he sees it. He has discernment. He can tell you what is of God and what's not of God. Also notice he knew Jesus Christ is the one who takes away sin. He points you in the right direction for salvation, not towards a works-based gospel. Number three, a true preacher sticks with the old stuff. Let's read John 1, 19 through 23. It says, And this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou, who art thou that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. Um, John did no miracle, according to John 10.41, but everything he said was true because he spoke of Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. John was such a good preacher that in a time and around people, who wanted nothing but signs and miracles. He got their attention without signs and miracles. So much so... That in a time and around people who wanted nothing but signs and miracles, he got their attention without signs and miracles. 
so much so that they asked him if he was Elijah. And a true preacher today should be so King James Bible based and so against sin and preaching things negatively that they accuse him of being like the old time preachers. A true preacher will stick with the old stuff, the old book, the old hymns, the old paths. No contemporary music, no NIV preaching, just King James Bible preaching. Negative, not positive. And something interesting is that John the Baptist is definitely a type of Elijah. And Jesus said this about John in Matthew eleven twelve through 14. He said, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. When Jesus says, If ye will receive it, that shows the Jews had a free will. If they would have received Jesus as who he was, the Messiah and Savior, the King, the one who was prophesied about, then John would have been the fulfillment of Elijah coming back. And Jesus said, And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. So John was so much like Elijah that he would have been the second coming of Elijah had the Jews accepted Jesus Christ. I'm not sure I understand it perfectly, but I know that the Jews had a free will they rejected the Messiah, and God postponed the kingdom. The church age started. That's what we're in now. But the, they didn't accept him, and the kingdom was postponed, and God allowed what we call the church age to happen. And that is where we get in the family of God. During the church age, God is dealing with the Gentiles, and we get in the family of God by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. He died. He died for us. He shed his blood. He was buried. He rose again the third day. We get in the family of God by believing that gospel and relying on that as our payment for our sin. And then in Matthew seventeen ten through 13, it goes on more to say, And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come, which is Elijah? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias has come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. So since the Jews rejected Jesus Christ, Elijah will still be coming back as one of the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. But John would have been Elijah. Uh, number four, a true preacher is nothing but a voice. In John 1, 23 through 28, it says, He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. Notice that it says, And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. Note that the same way God sent John, the devil will also send his crowd, the Pharisees, or anyone else who's against God. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? And the prophet is Moses. And then verse 26 says, John answered them, saying, I baptize with water. But there standeth one among you, whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me whose shoes latch it, I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. In terms of not exalting himself, his words aren't promoting his own good works that he is presently doing. He's promoting the Lord Jesus Christ. He is only a mouthpiece for Jesus Christ. And this shows he is full of the Holy Ghost. Luke one fifteen says, he was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother womb, mother's womb. Speaking of John the Baptist, how do you know if a man's voice is pointing you in the right direction? It has to agree with the words of God. Amos 3.3 3 says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? John basically tells the Pharisees his baptism points to one coming who will baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire. As he says in Matthew 3.11, 
And God also used the voice of Moses. In Exodus 4.12, it says, Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. He said that to Moses. And he uses the voice of John the Baptist in the same way, and he will do the same thing with the saints in the time of Jacob's trouble. If you've read Mark 13.11, it says, But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate. But whatsoever shall be given in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Today God puts wor his words in the mouth of his preachers and teachers when they read the words of God and hide them in their heart. If you get them in your heart, then he can speak through you. And many preachers don't speak the words of God because they aren't in their heart. And Jesus said, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Not only will you speak the words, but you will speak them with boldness. I have heard many preachers who are very bold when they speak, like my pastor, Donnie Dalton. He definitely matches Proverbs 28.1 that says, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Even if a preacher doesn't yell his words, that he speaks are bold and authoritative because he is speaking the words of God. Like Pastor David Hoffman, he never yells or raises his voice, but he is bold and confident in the truth. Learning the doctrine of the Bible and getting confident in that can give you boldness. And he definitely has boldness because he's learned the Bible and he's confident in the truth. Matthew seven twenty eight through 29 says, And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. If you know the Bible and you know the doctrine of the Bible, then you can speak with authority because you're speaking from the final authority. Number five, a true preacher will be doctrinally sound. Although many preachers and teachers will disagree on minor subjects, they will be able to come to an agreement on the major subjects that one has to believe to be a Bible believer. And there are some subjects that we, can, that we can't agree to disagree on. One of them is the way of salvation. It has to be through Jesus Christ or it's hell. And there's no... You can't disagree on that. Everybody has to agree on that. John the Apostle writes about John the Baptist and gives us details on what he believes. In John one thirty two it says, And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. So the Holy Spirit descends from heaven like a dove onto Jesus Christ. The dove in Genesis left Noah's ark and didn't land until it landed here on Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is like a dove like a busy bird, and that is where you get the saying. His job is to convict the world of sin. There's a lot of sin going on. He's busy and turn people in the direction of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit's always working. He's drawing all men to salvation. John one thirty three and 34 says, And I knew him not, but that he sent me to baptize with water. The same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him. The same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost, and I say and bear and I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. We see clearly that John believes in the deity of Jesus Christ because he calls Jesus the Son of God. It is a false doctrine to believe that Jesus Christ is just a man. He is God in flesh. When John baptized Jesus Christ and saw the Holy Spirit descend on him like a dove, he knew that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. If you call Jesus Christ the Son of God, then you make him equal with God. And I'm sure John the Baptist had read Isaiah 7:14 that says, "Therefore the Lord shall, there are, therefore the Lord Himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel." So Mary was with child of the Holy Ghost. It was God's son that she gave birth to, and God begets God. Like man begets man, God begets God. Uh, we see from verse 32 that John believed and bare record that there is a Holy Spirit. He wasn't a oneness preacher. He believes in one God that could manifest himself differently. A great picture of the Godhead is when Jesus is in the water, he's being baptized, and then the Holy Spirit descends on him, and a voice from heaven 
which is the Father, speaks and says, My beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So you have the Father talking, the Holy Spirit descending, and then Jesus Christ in the water. So that's all one God, but he can manifest himself in more than one place. We can't do that. God has a body, a soul, and a spirit. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. But I can't put my body here and my spirit here and my soul here like God can. Also take note that John had his eyes open spiritually. He saw the spirit descending like a dove. We, not, we may not be able to visibly see things today, but a true preacher or teacher or Bible believer, Bible student will have his spiritual eyes open to understand the words of God when the spirit shows it to him. And John baptizes with water, but he says Jesus Christ will baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And the baptism of the Holy Ghost refers to the spirit baptism where the believer is baptized into the body of Jesus Christ the moment he believes the gospel. Galatians 3, 26 and 27 says, For ye are all, ye are all the children of God by faith in G Christ Jesus. For as many of you has have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You're baptized into Christ the moment you believe the gospel. And John the Apostle who wrote the book of John, obviously believes in the deity of Christ, as did John the Baptist. Because in John 1.14, John the Apostle says, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You need to underline, underline that in your Bible, where it says, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. That Word is said to be God, and... John chapter 1 at the beginning of John chapter 1 it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then here in John 1 14 it says and the word was made flesh. So that's a good verse on the deity of Christ you need to underline in John 1 14. And then number 6 a true preacher will cause others to follow Jesus Christ. If you look at John 1 35 through 40 it says again the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And take note on this, that Jesus walked, and still does walk. False gods can neither see, nor hear, nor walk, according to Revelation 9.20. So Jesus walks, he's not a false god, and then two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. And in the Bible, the tenth hour would be the time from three to four p.m. And then verse 40 says, One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So if a preacher or teacher or soul winner will keep the focus on Jesus Christ and his word, then it will lead others to follow Jesus Christ. If you follow the right man, then you will end up following Jesus Christ. But if this man keeps his focus on his own personal convictions and personal revelations, then they will focus on him, the man, because he will be the standard instead of focusing on Jesus Christ. But John exalted the Savior, and when they began to follow Jesus Christ, this would, this would have pleased John. He wouldn't have been jealous. This was the point of his ministry. John was a humble preacher. He wasn't able to wear fancy suits and ties. He wore a leather girdle and camel's hair and ate locusts and wild honey. He wasn't some big shot person. Since he was humble, he was exalted. In Matthew eleven eleven, Jesus said, There hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. And since John follow, since John's followers began to follow Jesus Christ, they also led others to Jesus Christ themselves. If you read John 1, 40 through 42, it says, One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. 
The best thing you can do for another person is to lead them to Jesus Christ. The second best thing you can get them to do is follow Jesus Christ. John obviously did this as well. Today, a preacher or good Christian soul winner can get a person saved by giving them the gospel. But many times after this, that person only uh, cares about them as a number, a number to their soul winning count and doesn't care about helping disciple that person. You would be helping lead more souls to Jesus Christ if you go back to that person you won to Christ and help them become a disciple because then they will begin to lead others to Jesus Christ themselves. And the best way to make a disciple is to get them interested in the Bible. The Bible can keep a person straight and holy even when you're not around to help them. And the Bible is always there and always can be opened. And to end this chapter, let's look at reasons why men still reject Jesus Christ even though John was a true preacher. They still rejected the message. If you look at John 1, 10 through 12, it says he was in the world. It's talking about Jesus. And the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Jesus created everything. Uh, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. The Jews rejected him. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That's us. Receiving is more than believing. I don't just believe Jesus Christ is real. I take it a step further and receive him as my payment for sin. John 1, 13, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It says not of blood because no one was born a son of God. I was, wasn't was born a son of God. It says nor of the will of the flesh, so showing we can't be made a son by our works. It has to be by faith. Then it says, not the will of man. So it's not by church membership. It's our new birth is of God. We become a son of God because Jesus Christ died. He died on the cross for our sins and we accepted that. And that's how we get in the family. But the people rejected Jesus Christ because he was not of this world. And the Bible says, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It also says a friend of the world is the enemy of God. It also says love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Jesus Christ was not of this world. He left the third heaven and took many steps down to get here. And he left his perfect home in heaven to come to what John calls a present evil, or what the Apostle Paul calls a present evil world. And you know, you are slacking up on your love for God and the word when the world begins to look sweeter. Always keep in mind that the whole world lieth in wickedness. Remember who the God of this world is that blinds the mind of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them. And in verses 11 through 12 it says, Jesus Christ came into his own, and his own received him not. He came to the Jews, and the Jews rejected him.